Joining us is Russell Smart, Chairman of the National Scouting Museum Task Force, a part of the Philmont Ranch Committee. And today we're going to be talking about jamborees. Russell, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're My here pleasure. at the summit, now the home of the jamboree. Let, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Why do we have jamborees? Why are they important? Well, jamboree is a great way for scouts from all over the country and all over the world to get to meet other young men and women who are involved in the scouting movement and have a lot of fun, do activities, but get the bigger picture that scouting is a worldwide movement. It's not just something that happens uh, on one night a week at some place in your local community or your local council. It involves millions and millions of young people from all over the world. Obviously, there was a world jamboree that predated the U.S. jamboree. So just real briefly, tell us a little bit about those world jamborees and how they influenced the start of the national jamboree. Lord baden Pole, who began scouting as our founder uh, by the, after the Great War was over in the teens, he had wanted to have some type of event to bring scouts from all over the world together. So he came up with the idea of this thing that he and Lady BP decided they would call a jamboree. And jamboree was actually a word that he created. Uh, it's, there's lots of different stories about how it was, but uh, Lady BP herself said that it was a combination of, of, two, uh, of two words that were put together. Uh, jam, because they were all gonna be jammed together in a tight space, and ORI the, came from a, an event that was being held in Australia that was called a corroboree. So Lady BP and Lord BP took those two notions, the ORI and the jam together and made the word jamboree to have for that. 1920 was the first world jamboree, then another one in 1924, another one in 1929, uh, that was back in England, 24 was in Denmark, 33 was in Hungary, then in 1937, uh, there was a national jamboree that was planned for Holland. But prior to that, the Boy Scouts of America decided we need to have a jamboree, a national jamboree. And different countries around the world, other countries that had scouting had also started having national jamboree events to prepare scouts to later participate in the world jamboree. So we were planning for 1935, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt had agreed that we could have the National Jamboree on the mall in Washington, D.C. So all the planning was done, and then there was a scare of polio. Uh, this was way before there was anything such as a vaccine against polio, and so putting scouts together was a, not a good idea if that would spread polio amongst them. So the 35 Jamboree was canceled and rescheduled for 1937 on the National Mall in Washington. Franklin Roosevelt was still president, attended, it was a great event, and that was our first National Jamboree, 1937. The Jamboree obviously wasn't held on the mall every year. Where did the Jamboree go from there? Well, World War II then intervened after 1937. Uh, the National Jamboree was held and the World Jamboree in Holland was held. That was baden Powell's last big event as the Chief Scout of the World, in fact, and then he retired to Africa, to Kenya. After World War II was over, Scouting was in, uh, enthusiastically happening and beginning again and picking back up steam. And the next National Jamboree was 1950. And that was held at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania uh, to commemorate that great event in American history of, of President, uh, then Commander-in-Chief George Washington of the Revolutionary Army and their winter sojourn at Valley Forge. So that was the location for the second National Jamboree and so um, I, it didn't stay there. It had a future in other places. What was the next destination for the next? Next destination was Irvine Ranch in California. Uh, that site is, there's still, uh, you can still identify that site where the Jamboree was held. Then it was back to Valley Forge in 1957, then back out west to Colorado Springs in 1960, and then back to Valley Forge again in 64. So during those earliest years, it was sort of flip-flopping between the East Coast, Valley Forge, and the West Coast, Colorado Springs, Irvine Ranch in 50, 53. As we move forward uh, with the time, it's bouncing back and forth. There was a unique year when they did two jamborees, one on the east side of the country, one on the west side of the country. 
And they had some participation from the Apollo astronauts in that, uh, that event as well. That's right. So the space program was in full-fledged uh, uh, progress. We were going to the moon numerous times uh, with Eagle Scout Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Uh, doing the first one at Apollo 11, but then others were making visits as well. So it was, uh, if it was possible, and there was a coincidence of a National Jamboree and an Apollo mission, it was set up that the astronauts could actually speak to the scouts at the Jamboree during one of the big stadium shows, and that was done. And we still have had, even in more current times, we've had communications with astronauts above, uh, aboard the International Space Station, are one of the space shuttle missions. So what was, uh, they did this in two locations. Why did they choose two locations and was it something that turned out to be successful or not? So 1969, the Jamboree was in Idaho uh, at a, a state park there in Idaho, Farragut State Park, and it was very successful. In fact, the World Jamboree, the one other time that we had the World Jamboree was 1967, also at Farragut. In 1973, the leadership of the Boy Scouts of America decided to try an experiment. Let's have a jamboree on both the east side of the United States and the west side of the United States. So we had a dual jamboree, an east jamboree and a west jamboree. Farragut State Park was the west jamboree as it had been in 67 and 69. The east one was held at Moraine State Park in the western part of Pennsylvania. So we had the two jamborees going on, not concurrent with each other, exactly the same dates, but they somewhat overlap one right after the other. Uh, lots of scouts were there, and it was a big deal, but logistically, it was tough. And so the decision was made, okay, not gonna do that again. So following those jamborees, the, uh, eventually we ended up at Fort AP Hill for a number of jamborees. Talk about that experience at Fort A.P. Hill and, and why that worked so well. We did one more at Moraine in 77 and then in 81 we came to Fort A.P. Hill. Uh, the Scouts have always had a great relationship with the various branches of the United States military. Many Scouts go on to careers as either enlisted men or officers in one of the branches of the armed forces and that's a wonderful thing. And so the Army agreed that this would be a wonderful way to introduce Scouts uh, to, the, to an Army base by allowing us to use a part of this large facility in, in Caroline County, Virginia uh, for our National Jamboree. So 81 was the first one and then we stayed there. Uh, 85, 89, 93, 97, 2001, 2005, and then we skipped a beat and went five years in between and had a jamboree in 2010 to celebrate the centennial of the Boy Scouts of America there at, at a big national jamboree at Fort A.P. Hill in Caroline County, Virginia. Now it turned out to be the last one there. It did. And the, the BSA was looking for a permanent home for uh, the national jamboree and potentially another world jamboree. So tell us about the development and, the, and, and how the summit came to be. Well, contrary to what some people believe, we weren't thrown out of AP Hill. The Army was happy for us to continue coming and, and doing our jamborees there, but we got concerned. Uh, the military was using AP Hill more and more for certain types of training, uh, and we were fearful that a time might come when Fort AP Hill might not be available and we would get caught with no place to go. And so a special committee was, was put together. Jack First was the chairman and other members of the Boy Scouts of America. And their task was to see if they could find somewhere in the continental United States an appropriate place to have as a permanent home for the National Jamboree of the Boy Scouts of America. They did a, a, a request for proposals all over the country. Uh, there were over 80 sites that were submitted by the states within the United States, excluding Hawaii and Alaska. And those, uh, those various proposals were evaluated by this special committee chaired by Jack First. And eventually it was narrowed to a dozen or so, and then eventually it was narrowed to three. Uh, one in Arkansas, one, another site in Virginia, and this site in West Virginia. And so then over a, a, very, uh, a very interesting process, 
the, the decision was eventually made that the site in West Virginia was the right one. Then Governor, now Senator Joe Manchin, was instrumental in bringing the Boy Scouts to West Virginia and to the summit. He came to the Scouts in, in Virginia and he is reputed as saying, gentlemen, the Boy Scouts and the state of West Virginia go together like peas and carrots. And what can we do to get you to come and make your site of the National Jamboree in the great state of West Virginia? We were impressed. And so ultimately the deal was put together. The Bechtel Family Foundation provided a huge and most generous philanthropic gift along with others uh, like Mr. Scott and Mr. Goodrich, uh, Jim Justice, many others, console energy uh, funding. So all of the funding to put this magnificent site together here at the summit came from donors who were uh, in love with and sympathetic with the mission and vision of the Boy Scouts uh, of America. It evolved, Harold, from being just a place to have a national jamboree to be a year-round operation like our other adventure bases, Philmont, Northern Tier, Sea Base. So now the summit is one of a wonderful portfolio of four adventure bases where a scout can go and get all sorts of different high adventure opportunities. You mentioned that uh, this is a year-round facility and, uh, and particularly in off years for Jamboree, uh, they actually offer an opportunity for councils to do summer camp here, if I understand yes, correctly. Yes, they do. How does that work? So we have two programs, the High Adventure Program, uh, which is uh, takes to a higher level some of the events that we do during the National Jamboree. And then we have a National Scout Camp. Uh, the funding for that was provided by now Governor of West Virginia, Jim Justice. And so the Justice Scout Camp provides opportunities for scouts to come and try out the high adventure stuff that's here at the summit, but also to work on basic scouting advancement skills, merit badges, some of the same things that you would do uh, back at a local scout camp. But we do some of the badges and activities that might be beyond the capability of many local scout camps. That's, that's fascinating and, and really kind of cool. A little bit about the World Jamboree being here. Uh, obviously, this is the place to do it, and it was done in conjunction with Mexico and Canada. Right. What was the reason for that that group of countries, and um, what was the experience like? Wayne Perry, who was again a great one of our great scouting volunteers, national board member, uh, past national president, member of the World Scout Bureau, uh, WP as he likes to be called, had the vision and the idea that it was time for the United States to once again be the host for the World Jamboree. But WP also had a, the great idea that, of, that we should do this in conjunction with our neighbors. And those neighbors are Canada and Mexico. So WP approached the uh, Scouts of Canada and the Scouts of Mexico and asked them if they would partner with us in a three-way partnership and make a proposal to the uh, World Scout uh, Bureau that we would be the host, but it would be a North American hosted World Jamboree, not just a United States hosted Jamboree, as it had been in 1967, the one other time. That was actually the 12th, and I think it's pretty cool that we hosted the 12th World Jamboree, and then we hosted the 24th Jamboree. So kind of interesting there, I think, in, in, a, in a sense. So WP and a, a dream team of scouts from the United States, Canada, and Mexico presented our proposal. It was adopted uh, in uh, very shortly after we actually started construction here at the summit in 2011. Uh, we got the nod to host the 2019. So for the next eight years, Scott Sarles as our chairman and a great group of volunteers and professionals uh, put together the program that became the 2019 World Scout Jamboree, the 24th World Scout Jamboree. And Andrew Morgan, a NASA astronaut from the space station, had an opportunity to do a Q&A with scouts there, which was kind of cool. Right, so it kind of goes full circle, doesn't it? It absolutely Harold? does. Um, 2023, next National Jamboree, yes. starting signups now? Absolutely. So, we, you know, we were hoping to have the next one that would have fallen in the cycle would have been 2021. And like a lot of things, that fell victim to the worldwide pandemic and the effects of COVID. So it was postponed, uh, not canceled, but postponed 
and the post decision was recently made that 2023, we're ready to go again. So 2023 here at the summit will be our next National Scout Jamboree. A great committee has, has now been put together. Uh, Tico Perez, a former National Commissioner of the Boy Scouts of America is chairman. He's got a great team of professionals and volunteers who are working right now as we speak to put together the program for the next National Jamboree in 2023, and you can sign up now. All right. Well, thank you very much for all that interesting information about the history of the Jamboree, in particular here at the summit. That's all the time we have for this time. Join us again as we continue to learn more about the history of the Boy Scouts of America through the collection of the National Scouting Museum and Artifact of the Week. <laughs>